we're talking about the hash, the hashgacha, which is when a person does a deed or an act. The question is, how does the rabbanu shalom interact as a consequence of the deed? That's what we're talking about. In any case, so I had mentioned is that Yisurin or suffering can either be a warning or punishment. Uh, in, in other words, what does that mean? In other words, if a person has done uh, something which is wrong and the Baruch wants to warn him, so what he will do is give him some type of Yisurin or suffering and that will serve as a warning because a person generally will say to himself, well, why is God doing that? You see, but obviously what's interesting is that you have to believe that all suffering is from God. If you don't believe that, which unfortunately many people don't, they think it's just a matter of, uh, well, bad luck. Of course they're not going to consider their wrong deeds because they don't know the concept that suffering comes from God. Rather, or, and not only that, all things come from God. So obviously in today's time, you know, when we look at it today's time, uh, most suffering are not because of warnings. Most suffering is really because of punishment. That the Baruch is trying to, in some way, uh, atone for the uh, sins or misdeeds of all these people. You see. So what, would, what was true many years ago would not be true, basically, in many ways today. There's no immuna, there's no belief that God is in control of everything. People think that everything is chance. You know, it just happens. But in general, uh, uh, suffering can be a warning. That's an important idea. Uh, another concept which the Ramchal brings, which is interesting, is that there are many people who are very evil who are very evil, and what that means is that their evil deeds outweigh by far the good deeds that they have. So these people, since the majority of their deeds is bad, is evil, sinful, so they won't get Oilam Habo. They will be obliterated or annihilated. That's generally. <clears throat> but it's interesting that sometimes uh, what the Bansham does is he will allow an evil person to succeed in doing evil. Why is that? Because then what he does is the evil person builds up a case against them which is much worse than uh, had God not allowed him to do the evil. In other words, ultimately, he will be destroyed, annihilated. In other words, for somebody who is evil, the Bansham will in many ways sometimes give success to the evil person to, be, uh, to do the evil, and thereby that person does enough to warrant annihilation. And in other words, and, and he does. Because the rule is that the Bansham decides by a Russia how much evil he will allow him to do. You know, Sometimes we look at a person and we say, wow, there's no limit to the evil. But for instance, let's say Hitler Machshamai in World War II, right? What the evil he did, we cannot even begin to comprehend. 56 million people died. That's the amount of people who died in World <coughs> War II. Because he lived. 56 million people died. And the Bansham allowed him to do the evil. In fact, he saved his life. Because that was part of the... Many times, exactly, which I had spoken about. And that is because, uh, unfortunately, Hitler's plan served the divine plan. It coincided with the divine agenda, which I had spoken about and so on, you know. But even Hitler comes to an end. He committed suicide. Uh, you know, at the end of the war, he finally uh, committed suicide in an underground bunker, you know. So every person does have a limit does have a limit in terms of how much evil he can do 
And like I said, many times Moshe will allow that person to do the evil so he can fill up what's called the measuring cup to annihilate him, you see. Because sometimes a person does something good and that will stand against the annihilation, you see. So what the Baruch Hashem does is he actually allows him to fill up the measuring cup of evil and that will overcome whatever merits he has to survive and then the Baruch Hashem destroys him and just instantly overturned. I mean, a lot of classic people like that, you know. One of the classics, of course, is Haman. He was allowed to do the evil because Klai Yisrael sinned by the meal of, of Ahasuerus and so on. So Baruch Hashem allowed Haman to rise and to threaten the Jewish people with annihilation, you see. And in one day, he was overthrown, which is amazing. Because Baruch Hashem said, At Khan, until now, so therefore, whatever merit Haman had, and any, everybody has some merit, you know, no, no, I, there's no such thing as a person who doesn't have anything, zero, you know. If he honored his father or mother, or he even said hello to another guy, that was a chesed, you know. Everybody has something. So therefore, sometimes that prevents the evil person from being annihilated. So therefore, what the Barsham does you know, he just, not, not that he puts into the mind of the Russia to do evil. That guy wants to do evil anyway. So Baruch Hashem says, okay, I will allow you to eat, do evil, and that will, you know, uh, supersede any of the good deeds you did, and therefore you'll be destroyed. So the Baruch Hashem actually does that sometime. Because in the end, somebody whose majority deeds, his uh, acts which are evil, you know, it, it's terrible. You know, what do you want? Why do you, It's astounding why people can do that. You know, how often do I hear a story, you know, somebody tells me, and I can't believe that a human being would do this to another human being. You know, it, it's almost like there's an incredible amount of pleasure that they get by inflicting an enormous amount of pain and suffering on people for no reason. You know, for no reason, basically. You know, and it's, it's astounding to watch. Where is your humanity of people, you know? We're not talking here about doing good deeds, right? We're talking about where's the, the absence of humanity? And you hear about it many times, you know, it's especially, you know, with people in power, where they'll make somebody suffer for nothing. It's illogical, you see, you know? Uh, so we don't, we don't even really begin, it's hard to believe, like I said, you know, that there are people that can be that evil, you know, <coughs> but there are, but there are. I'm not even talking about through history, the Goyim, you know, <coughs> there were people that if they would win a war, you can't believe what they would do to the victims, you know, it was just incredible. Uh, I don't want to even go into that, it's, it's just horrendous stuff. It's hard to believe that a human being can perpetrate such an incredible amount of evil to other people, you know. For what? There's no Rachmanus, there's no mercy, there's axorious, incredible amount of contempt and callousness and so on, when it's not required. So it's these type of people that the Bansham allows for them to be successful. And also, obviously, because they also fit the agenda. Many evil people, by the way, are used as in instruments of God. That's really what they're for. They have done their evil, because God doesn't force them to do evil. They have free will, right? So what God then does is He uses the evil people for His instrument, let's say, to give suffering to other people that need an atonement. Because think about it, you know, if people need an atonement, right, so how is He going to give them suffering? So one of the things that he does is he lets evil people do his job. You see? I mean, you know, there are, there are many ways to make somebody suffer, you know. But God has, it's astounding, you know, he has so many agents that he can use in humanity that will just gladly do the job of God and make people suffer. You see? It's hard to believe, you know. You know, it's interesting, that's one of the problems with America you see, or American, the American army, you know. They had problems fighting other people because they don't get it. They don't believe that people can be so evil, you know. 
I mean, one of the classics is the uh, ISIS. We believe what these guys did. You know, it, you know, it, it's like it boggles the mind. You know, f forget about what you think about Islam. But can, does Islam say that if you want to kill somebody, you got to kill them that way? You know, in in halacha, there's a halacha called you know, choose a, a good death for him. So they give you the easier death because okay, you're gonna kill the guy because let's say he deserves death because of judgment or whatever. You know, you know. So there are different ways of killing him. But if you're able to, then you give him an easier way to die, you know. But these guys, you know, like ISIS, they choose the way which is unbelievable torture until a guy finally dies. He thanks God that he's dead. It's a little hard to do that. But you see, <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> so these are the guys, like I said, you know, where God, allowed, because so the desire of God is to eradicate these guys, you know, totally, you know. But he doesn't do it. Why? Because they serve as messengers and instruments to bring punishment to others. But these guys are really, they're, they're, you know, they're writing their death warrant, as they say, you know. And uh, so then once their ability to serve as an agent of God is over, right, they're gone. And when I mean gone, they are obliterated. And don't think that they're obliterated. First, they have to undo what they did in Gehenna. You see, that's where they really get to find out the consequences of their deeds. And then after the Gehenna is over, and believe me, you know, humans can, a human soul cannot suffer that type of punishment. But in Gehenna, you're a soul, so your soul can take punishment which we cannot even comprehend in this world. And then when they're finished with Gehenna, then they are annihilated, you see. So they, got, they get what's coming to them. But anyway, so that's what Dubansham does why he allows the, these type of people to survive, you know, and, and, and so on. Like I said, either because they use as an instrument, which he uses to bring atonement to others, or they don't have enough, they have too many merits to kill them now. So what the Barsham does, okay, I will allow you to do more evil, so that will far outweigh, so that uses up their merits, right? And shh, they're gone. God destroys them. Yeah. Another option to this is when the average person sees this going on in life, they yeah. can fool themselves so easily that yes. there's no divine law, That's there's right. no rationale, but the, yes. and it, yeah. eventually there's no God, they'll say. Yes, I know. That's the, that, but God takes that into account. Because the fact that evil flourishes is a tremendous contradiction to belief in God. It is. Even though we know that it can fit somehow in the plan. We know that, you know, because there's a place for evil in this world. There are, you know, there are rationales, justifications, or whatever. But when you see it done, what's the first thing you think? How did God allow this, you know? So you begin to think what's called less din for less dying. Obviously, less din, there's no judgment, and less dying, there's no judge. That's what people realize, you know. And, and that is obviously uh, tragic, but God takes that into account. Because he's not going to stop himself, you know, from using these evil people, right? Because somebody's going to be coming up at Curtis. You know, hey, you have to believe that there's God and that this has a cheshman. And I'm giving you, and I'm, a cheshman means an accounting. And I'm giving you two reasons why these guys can keep succeeding, right? One is because they, they, they actually satisfy the agenda of God in terms of people needing punishment or suffering for a kapora, for atonement, or that they have certain merits, you know. I mean, you take a look at some of these Nazi guys, you know, they're 95, 98, they can't even stand trial, they're so old, you know. Why in the world would God allow these guys who killed how many thousands, tens of thousands of Jews in the most best, <coughs> the most cruel way possible, we don't know, but the, obviously the answer is because they did have merits. What God did is he said, okay, I'm going to let you live a long time, right? And that will use up all your merits. And then they face Gehenna and obliteration. You know, you know there's a reckoning for everybody. It's like a cafeteria. That's a famous example, right? Hey, you could choose whatever you want, right? 
I want this, I want that pie, I want this, right, you know? But then there's a cashier at the end of the line, pay, right? That's the same thing, you know? This world is a world that God, in many ways, allows you to choose. And if you want to do evil, you can do evil. And then at the end of the line, there's a pay-up cashier, and that's, of course, you know, um, that's when things turn around, and so on, you know. Anyway, so that's an understanding in terms of why evil exists, in the sense of why it flourishes, why it's allowed to flourish, you see, you know. I give an example, you know, it's another, you know, like, let's say, let's say, uh, there are people that really should get the Guinness World Book of Records for evil that they've done. I mean, Hitler's one of them, but he's not the only one. He's got a whole team with him, you know. There's, what do you call it, there's Stalin. Pol Pot. Right, a Pol Pot. What that guy did, Cambodians. But it just, and he died in his bed. I'm just going to tell you that. He died, I mean, you know, he's an old man, he died. You believe a guy like that? Killed three million people for what? Because he wanted to become a communist? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, we cannot comprehend the evil, you know? There's a Mao Tse, Mao Tse Dong, you know? I think he killed a hundred million Chinese or something like that, you know? Uh, because of his forward thinking, whatever, you know? Why did God allow that? Because there you're looking at something different. Even, I think, Khrushchev killed millions of Ukrainians. He starved them to death or whatever, you know? Who? Stalin. No, Stalin, Stalin I know. But, no, no, Ukraine. even Khrushchev, I remember he reading that. He himself was Ukrainian. But he killed many, many people died under Stalin him. sent him to the Ukraine. Khrushchev was like man. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but there, you see, there you're looking at what's called mass kilgulam. Mass. Where God says, okay, I'm going to bring back all the Assyrians, you know, or the, uh, you know, all the, uh, the Babylonians that massacred. Or I'm going to bring back all those people in the Crusades that, you know, they just went around. Oh, we don't know. There are millions of these guys, right, through history that have committed acts of such brutality, right? So there God brings them all back, right, and bingo. There was some, some guy kills, comes, comes around and kills 30 million of them, you see? That's, that's, that, that, so when you look at mass murder, you're really looking at a mass amount of individuals that God has returned. I mean, it's tragic. But I want to tell you something. That does not mean that people who see this pull the, you know, relinquish. No. You have to go in and stop it. Mm. You know, the slaughter in, uh, what's in, in um, Rwanda? The Houthis and the Tutsis, whatever these guys call themselves, they used to take machetes and hack them to death, you know? And, 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 and nobody said anything, nobody cared. That, that itself was an unbelievable evil, you know? So it's like they say, you know, what God wants to do, that's his business. Your business is to stop evil as much as you can. So what the UN should have done, right? How do you allow a nation to do that to its citizens or people? It's, it's genocide. Right? So they should have come in and destroyed or stopped the slaughter and then br bring everybody up to uh, justice and so on. Of course it was never done because most of the UN is evil. All those countries who are sitting on the human rights councils, right? right? I mean, you have to laugh at this, right? I, who are the countries sitting on the human rights commission? Like Syria. Syria, you know, I think. They, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I want to tell you something. In the end, in the end, you know, we're going to be in this humongous stadium. All mankind will be there, right? Right? And you're going to see these guys being judged. And the one who's going to have the biggest laugh is God. Because he's going to laugh. So I don't stand. We, we, you know, how do you come and make this kind of, allow this with some, how do you put Syria on the Human Rights Commission? Like, what does that even mean? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and God, in other words, the, the, the deed that these people do with the UN and the commissions and all that is so absolutely illogical that, you know, you have to laugh. I mean, you have to cry, really, but in the end you have to laugh. You can't believe this, that this is the way humans think. You know, it's an insult to the human race. What can I say, you know? Uh, but uh, look, all this is meted out with absolute justice. 
these guys come back and they pay dearly for what they did. You know, you talk about the pogroms and the crusades. You know, you talk about the ancient civilizations that butchered people left and right. Your life wasn't worth a plug nickel, as they say, in most of these countries. And you get away with it. They didn't care and so on, you know. This is at the final judgment that they say? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you will not believe what will take a place at the final judgment. Because then God weighs the end of history. Because what you are judged at is not your own deeds, but the consequences of your deeds, right? You killed 50, 30 million people. Well, you are judged not only on 30 million people. What about all their descendants? You know, they deserve to live. You see, and all what happens if you bankrupted a whole country because you killed so many people? So, could you imagine the weight of the evil that these people have? So God, you know, waits till the end because that's the full consequences of the evil that you've done. And then he presents you with the case. And obviously, you know, what are you going to say and all that? And you, of course, are dealt with with complete justice, you see. So evil in itself has a rationale uh, of why it happens, you know. And it's not just, well, you know, one thing is interesting, you, you'll notice that there's a third world nation. There are many countries in this world that are poor, very poor. There are some nations where people starve. You know, some nations where they make, what, $20 a month? I mean, you know, you're, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're a ser Mexican servant that comes in to do your housekeeping. She makes more per hour than these people make in a month. The question is, what does that mean? So you have to remember one thing. Many people, which is interesting to know, many people are chayv misa, death. That's what they deserve for all the evil that they've been doing with all the incarnations that they've been uh, going through, you know? They deserve death. That's the sentence that God or, or, or justice would, would mete out to these people, you see. But, but the question is, what are you going to do? Most of mankind should die. You don't realize most of these people coming back are people that have lived and have committed incredible atrocities. All kinds of genocide and so on and so forth. When you think about the horrors and the evil of mankind. I mean, and it's not just people, it's religions. How many, Catholicism, Christianity. How many people have they butchered, right? For what? You know, they threw out the Jews of Spain. Why? Because they wouldn't uh, convert to Christianity? So what? So, you know, so God will take care of them. Where do you come off throwing out the whole country, you know, or killing people, burning them at the stake, you know, because they were practicing Judaism in secret or whatever. <clears throat> we cannot even comprehend the evil that has been done for thousands of years. But God can. You see, so what he does, like I said, he will bring back a whole bunch of them en masse. Now, here's the problem. Can't kill everybody. I mean, genocide happens once in a while. Doesn't happen all the time, right? So what about all those people that should die, right? But you can't, God can, does not allow genocide to go day and day. You know, every once in a while you have some crazy incident, right? Like, you know, the Bi you know, uh, Biafra is one, and the Rwanda is another. The, the, the genocide and so on, you know? So what's God going to do with all those people that really deserve death? But he can't kill everybody. You see? So what God does, he gives what's called judicial equivalence. It's a very important idea. What's a judicial equivalent? There are four situations which are judicially, according to the law, the halacha, the Torah, equivalent to death. One is poverty, <coughs> real poverty. There's, death, there's a death sentence. It's chosh of kemes, as the Gemara says. Okay? Another is a, a woman that doesn't have any kids. A third is a blind person. And a fourth is a mitzura, uh, a tzuras. Because all of these people in some way cannot interact with society. They are incredibly limited in terms of what they can do they, they struggle to survive, or they are outcasts, each one. Now, it doesn't mean that every person, for instance, let's go through the poverty. You know, why is poverty real poverty? And I'm not talking about in welfare system, you know, where you can collect as much as you can. You know, you see these guys drink a beer all day and they have on welfare checks. No, that's not real poverty. That's American stupidity. It's a different kind of... Th 
<laughs> okay, I'm a real poverty. You know, the guys, let's say, in, uh, in India, you know, go looking through the scraps of, uh, of, the, of the garbage cans. I mean, that, that, that's real poverty, you know? Because he has no money, can't do anything. He cannot interact with life. He's as if he's dead. You know, can't buy anything really, you know? Everything is just, uh, uh, he's hoping that he can survive from day to day. So he's considered a dead guy. Okay, so that's one, right? A blind man, sight is the most important of all the senses, right? He's blind, so what can he do? Again, he's limited in terms of his ability to interact with life, you know? Third idea, let's say, is a woman who has no kids. The fact that she has no children means, obviously, that there's no continuity of her generations, of her life. You know, when she dies, it's over. Nobody remembers her. Nobody, you know, has any idea she ever existed, you know. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying people who don't have kids are high de death. No, not at all. But, but when a person does have that, it will satisfy the judgment of a death sentence. The converse is not necessarily true. If a woman doesn't have kids, it doesn't mean that really she should be getting a death sentence. No. But if that does happen and God wants to use it to satisfy the judgment, that can be what's called the judicial equivalent. Okay? Uh, and the fourth is a matsura, which only existed in the time of the, uh, you know, the Torah and so on and so forth, because he's outcast. He's not even in society. You know, uh, you know and he's got to be in, um, you know, in, in his own place until he becomes toho, pure, and then he can re-enter. So somebody's a social outcast, it's the same thing. So therefore God uses all of these four things, okay, as a death equivalent. That is why there is so much poverty in the world. You see, that solves it, right? Can't kill everybody. You can't have genocide going on, you know, every Monday and Thursday. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's clearly a death sentence. So what God does is he puts people into what's called a ju the judicial equivalent of death. So therefore there are many countries, it's called the third world, that are very poor. And to the extent of their poverty, you know, that are, is, what, what talking about extreme poverty, you know? There are countries that are extremely poor. I mean, take Haiti, for instance. I think Haiti is one of the most poorest countries on earth. You know, now, how does God make sure that Haiti will be poor? Because he puts rulers that are evil, right? You know, the worst curse a country can ha have is a ruler that is evil, that's only thinking about himself, you see. And then the guy, what was his name? He was still 94 years old in Botswana, I think it was us. You know, whatever. I mean, it was just beyond belief what these guys can do to their country. Venezuela, no. What was that? Venezuela. Yeah, Venezuela, yeah, yeah. Maduro, this guy, is, this guy takes the cake. It's beyond belief what this guy's doing to Venezuela. You know, you think any person, just as a side comment, you think any person that dis he's destroying Venezuela, that's what he's it's a doing. Rich country. Uh, sitting on the oil that, you know, forget about it. Although that no longer makes you rich, because oil is way down if you notice it's a gas pumps and so on, you know. But he's destroying Venezuela. People are running away in droves. Imagine they're running to Colombia, to Ecuador. He's destroying, you know? And nobody says anything, you know? This guy's allowed to rule. And he himself knows he's destroying the country. What does it take? Like Einstein to figure out he's destroying the country? But of course he won't because it's power, you know? <clears throat> and so on, you know? Why is God allowing uh, Maduro to destroy Venezuela? We don't know. But I guarantee you, if Venezuela did not deserve it, he would not be there. And who was that crazy idiot before him? Chavez. Chavez. Chavez? I mean, this guy's not a lunatic from outer space. You know what I'm saying? It's just incredible the, how these power people get in and so on, you know? Uh, but the world does nothing, and they say nothing, you know? Whatever. That's because they're all evil, basically, in the UN. So if they interfere with this guy, then guess what? then he's going to bring up a resolution to interfere and they're evil. You know, it's like, so nobody wants to say anything because, hey, we don't want you to mess up my evil. You know, it's, it's like an like unwritten law. You know, the UN can do only one of two things. They can try to condemn Israel. That's one of their main functions. <laughs> that's basically almost... <laughs> yeah, uh, it's to condemn Israel. Don't make it what Israel does, I me, mean, of course, you know. They're always wrong. It's like Trump. No matter what Trump does, he's always wrong. 
Whatever Israel does, it's always wrong, whatever, even though it's black and white, excuse me, right? Okay, so that's their first function, you know, and the second function is to keep them all in power, and nobody, God forbid, should interfere with any other country, because, hey, you know, I won't say anything about your evil, don't say anything about mine. It's a club, where everybody tacitly agrees and says, do not interfere with my evil, just if you can help me maintain my power, no problem. You can give me some money, some health benefits, you know, then it's okay. Anyway, so they are united. The nations are truly united in making people suffer and keeping evil people in power and so on. Well, that's the logic of it. That's why Syria can be in charge of the, uh, you know, the uh, Human Rights Council. You know, I want to tell you something. You can't even make this stuff up. You know, that Syria, I think, was the head or whatever, you know. You can't even make this up. You know, this is like, it's, it's fiction that you can't even make up. It's so crazy. Anyway, so therefore what God does is he can't kill the people, right? Can't have genocide going on every day, right? So what he does is he created the concept called third world. Yeah, that's it. So there are many countries in the world which are really poor. You know, they're called the third world and so on. And therefore, if a person has to come back really to... Uh, to uh, to go through the death sentence, then God makes him be born, you know, in, in somebody in that country. And he's extremely poor, and so on, you know. So poverty is one of the ways that God executes the judgment on people that are chayv misa. Now again, I want to, you know, caution. So, so what are you going to say? Well, does that mean you don't have to help them out? Because then you're going against the will of God? No. What God does is his business. But you are commanded to help people. You know what I'm saying? And uh, certainly Jews, right? Like God says, that the Evyoinim, the poor, will never cease. They'll always be poor because for whatever reason, you know, the same thing with Goyim. You still have uh, obligated, you know, uh, different people, whoever with their can and so on, to, to try to remove poverty. There's no question about that, you know. But I'm <coughs> saying but from the standpoint or the perspective of God, it is used as an equivalent to death extreme poverty is and so on you know in any case uh it actually is one more one more one more equivalent which is interesting uh which i use to explain the uh iraq iran war the uh the gulf the gulf war in 91 you know and that's pachat mavis because uh at that time, I don't go into the whole thing, but the, um, at that time began sort of like, in many ways, the last phase. Because in that era, in 89, 90, 91, you know what I'm saying, the era of Rav began to really uh, dominate, and the Arabs also. That's really when the, the whole intifada began and so on. <coughs> and that really begins, in a certain sense, the end of their domination. So what happened is that you could see the, the uh, Ketrugim and say, wait a minute, you can't begin this process because it brings us closer to redemption. There are many Jews that do not observe Torah, you know, willingly. There's a lot of sinning going around, so you can't do this. So what God said is, wait a minute, you, you have, you, you're right in terms of justice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the Jews who really have a death sentence on them, you know, in terms of then and all the gagulam, I'm going to give them an equivalent. You see? <coughs> so what's God going to do for the Jews? He's not going to make them blind. He's going to allow women to have kids. He's not going to make them poor. You know what I'm saying? And he's dead. There's no tzaraz anymore. So God selected the fifth. It's called pachad mavas, the fear of death. Fear of death is also a judicial equivalent to, to, to death. So therefore... Hussein, Saddam Hussein, rained all kinds of missiles. And if you remember, it's, it's like, what is that, almost 30 years ago already, you know, that there was a tremendous fear among the Jews. And to make sure that <coughs> the fear will remain, he had Bush, right, and so on, right, that he, the Bush said he restrained Israel from attacking uh, Iraq 
you know, because, um, because if you attack Iraq, so all of a sudden the Arabs won't join us in trying to overcome Iraq, which is ridiculous, and so on and so forth, you know. But anyway, so Israel had to re restrain themselves while these missiles rained down on Israel. And everybody was running into the shelters, if you recall. That's pachat mavis, fear of death. So with that act, God removed a tremendous uh, 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 capital punishment uh, that Jews were obligated because of the sins of that generation and the sins of all the previous generations and so on. And I realized at that time, so uh, there were people asked me, well, should they leave Israel? I said, no, no, nothing's going to happen because I realized that the Pachad Mavis, not the real Mavis, in fact, in that war, I think only one person died or two people max as a result. One. And he, you know, and he died of, I think, a heart attack because of a missile. It wasn't because, of, you know, a direct hit and so on and so forth. Because the real, the real punishment of the Persian Gulf War was pachad mavis. That was what God was doing. It's interesting. But anyway, so, therefore, many dictators are allowed to live, tyrants, because they make sure that their country is poor, you see? And that allows people who live in that country, if they are... Uh, what do you call guilty of a death sentence to be born in that country and then they are incredibly poor you know look seven and a half billions on this, billion people on this planet there are million, hundreds of millions of people that wake up every day and wonder what are they going to eat and forget about health services that's gone you know there's no clinics you know there's no hospitals there's nothing you know we don't live in that kind of society but could you imagine the fear the anxiety that these people wake up every day you know, knowing that what happens if they get sick, right? There's no food, there's no job. You know, it's incredible. You know, thank God Americans or the first or second world countries don't experience that. But this is all part of the judgment of God. It's an exact uh, judgment uh, in terms of how does God deal with evil, you see. Anyway, so that's what I'm trying to talk about. The whole concept of how God basically deals with evil itself. Anyway, so I hope that that becomes clear and so on and so forth. But the main thing to remember is one thing. The judgment of God is always precise. God will never give something, even a nanosecond of suffering, to somebody that doesn't deserve it. And on the contrary, there are so many times when the person does deserve it and God does not do it, you see? Because God waits, He's merciful, He's long-suffering, uh, all those things that we say in many ways every day. So anyway, that's, that's the concept of God in terms of the, uh, how He deals with evil people and so on, you know. <clears throat> you have to remember also, I think I said it last time, <clears throat> is that God does not punish a person first. He always will warn him in some manner but not only that, even when he decides to punish somebody, he has to take into account, wait a minute, you want to punish this guy, maybe his wife doesn't deserve that. So he's got to take that into account, you know? And he's got to take into account, well, maybe this guy had a grandfather, he's a big tzaddik. So how can I do it to this guy? Because the grandfather is a big tzaddik, tremendously righteous person, and that grandfather does not deserve, because of his merits, that I should do this to his grandson. So God takes into account the forebears, the predecessors. He takes into account the siblings and the wife, and also the uh, uh, the long the uh, what's called the imminent family, you know, immediate family, and then the uh, remote family. Then he takes into account, you know, the guy's friends. Maybe the guy has friends that are tzaddikim, and they would be pained if they knew that this guy was suffering, and they don't deserve that pain. Then he takes into account the whole generation, that maybe the generation will be pained. It's incredible how far it goes. And then he takes into account the whole city. You see, in the country, it's, <clears throat> it's incomprehensible, the judgment of God, how many things are taken into consideration, that in some way, before he can mete out justice to anybody, everybody has to deserve it. Only an infinite mind can figure this out on any given person. It's beyond comprehension how God, I once mentioned a long time ago, if a plane crashes, 
300 people die, everybody on that plane had to be on that plane to die. There wasn't one guy on that plane that didn't deserve, because if there was one guy on the plane that didn't deserve to die, guess what? That plane can't crash. It's incredible. Now, the question is, how did God maneuver everybody for each of their own individual reasons? You know, this guy was going to Bar Mitzvah, unfortunately, and this guy was going for a business deal, and this guy was going to vacation somewhere. Everybody has their own reasons. Yet all of them wound up on the plane, right, that killed them all. It's inconceivable how God even managed to get them all to fly on that plane, you know. But like I say, the judgment of God is beyond comprehension because, like I say, there are so many factors involved before God will do anything, you know. Takes everything to account, which means ultimately that everybody who suffers as a result of something has to in some way deserve it. In some way. It has to be appropriate for that person. Maybe to some people it has to be a warning, you know. But in some manner, they have to deserve either that suffering or that warning. It's like the Chofetz Chaim used to say, you know, when he would read uh, some cataclysmic event, uh, an earthquake happening somewhere in Asia. So the Chofetz Chaim would say that God, God is talking to us, not just doing his, what he does in terms of judge, judgment and justice, you know, to the country that the earthquake happened, but there's a message for the Jews. That's what the Chofetz Chaim used to say, you know, and, and so on, you know. Um, obviously, it's not always easy to figure out what the message is, you see. So that's the uh, judgment of God, you see. Then there are other ways that God interacts, you know. Many times, somebody has to be born to a certain person, and he has to be wealthy, because that's his assignment. So therefore, God makes the father wealthy, so this kid can inherit the wealth. That's nice, you know. Or, that's good, you know. Uh, or the father deserves the wealth, right? And like I say, you know, and maybe the son does something, so all of a sudden the father becomes wealthy because the son did something that enabled the father to deserve the wealth and the son also. There are so many variables. It's just beyond belief, you know? And then there's what's called the conflicts, the contradictions, you know? You know, well, let's say the father does something that deserves for him to be poor and his son does something that means that the son should be rich. So if God makes the father poor, then the son will be poor, you see? So there you have two causes, you have one, you have two causes, so what's God going to do? You see, if he makes the father poor, well, the son did something to make him wealthy. And if he makes the uh, father, the uh, son wealthy, well, the father doesn't have to be poor, so then what's God going to do? So many times you have two different causes which conflict with each other and God chooses one even though they're contradicting each other because God also weighs the third act idea which is what will this do for the tikkun of the Bria for the rectification of all mankind which takes precedence. You see? How do you figure this out? You know, you really get a feel that even a supercomputer kind of possibly deal with all the variables of the whole world. Impossible. Yet somehow God knows what is best and what's the best choice, even though there's contradictory causes. And there could be a hundred different contradictory causes. Father deserves, son doesn't deserve, spouse doesn't deserve, grandmother deserves, friend doesn't deserve, because if the guy becomes wealthy, right, then the friend of that father, you know, he's going to share maybe in some of the wealth, you know, and so on. That means everybody's got, that means there are so many different causes that contradict which way do we go. And the human mind can't possibly figure this out. But God does all the variables, the infinite variables, factors. God is able to figure out what to do and what's called move the tikkun the rectification process forward. Great. You got a question? Yes. Because we're now going to another area, wanna, which is fascinating. Uh, with the atrocities. Want to go back to that? Okay. Yes. 
Something puzzles. Uh, have I... Does it make sense? All the millions of chesbonus. But you see how it just... It's like incredible. Go figure out, you know. Guy can go crazy just trying to think about this. You know, for a half hour. How's God figure out what to do? And so on, because there's, there's just so many different variables. Yeah, what do you say? Throughout history, there were many nations that committed <coughs> atrocities against the Jews. Many. Why does God single out a Moloch and said, when the time comes... Single out a who? A Moloch. A Moloch. He said, you remember what they did to you when the time comes, mm. wipe them out. There yes. There were a lot of nations that killed us. And that is a very good question. Why does God hate a Moloch? Yeah, there were many nations. Too. Correct. Yes. Uh, that is an entire Shia which I once gave. It's called a Moloch. It's on the internet. It's under one of the Shulam I give, I've given for Purim. Amalek, you know. Why God hates Amalek. And I, I don't want to go into the whole Shia, but um, there's a tremendous premius there. Why God hates Amalek more than all other nations. You know, and so on. And as long as Amalek lives, then the ideology of Amalek lives also. When God says you must kill the Amalekis, the Amalekites, as they say, right? It's, it, it's not just them they represent a certain type of ideology. And that ideology is anathema to God, more than other nations, you see. And I once explained it in that Shia. Look it up, it's called Amalek, uh, on the Purim Shia, and you'll see the whole thing. I go into uh, many different ideas. Anyway, now, what was that? You said that somebody will be led to commit more atrocities allowed to commit more atrocities because he's evil yeah no, he will be he will be yes yes because he's evil and god gives him more rope to hang himself that's the english expression so why when, what when what does it mean that somebody is transferred to the realm of the satan say again what i i've heard different you know different stories different Whatever that he says, this person is now under the realm of the Satan, that he's <coughs> evil, and therefore now he's in this draft. Well, it, 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 it would mean that the Satan now has a carte blanche license to tempt this guy to do more evil. So that's basically what happens. Hashem says, okay, now this guy is being allowed to do more evil. Yeah, just that go. Be, that's it. To do you, more exactly. So God can terminate him. Right. Yeah. Now, if, if Hashem determines the consequence that not only the final judgment is about consequences, yes. So then, what happens with the consequences? There still has to be a din that requires some sort of retribution or gehenna. Yeah. But isn't the end of time where a person gets ibud? Well, he suffers in gehenna for the time duration that it takes to clean the slate, and then he's annihilated. So there's However long time that is. After. Yeah. Yeah, time is never the problem. Believe me, it's, you know, he gets what he deserves, and then he's gone. Yeah. I mean, what does that mean? Does, I mean, what happens if the world the, comes to an end? The length of time after the end yeah. to allow for this retribution. Yes, because maybe it could be that the, you know, nobody, you know, nobody really knows. It's actually going to happen. Yeah, because we don't really know how Gehenna operates. You know what I'm saying? There are no labor unions, so they have never disclosed... You know what the payment down there is, you know. What can you say, you know? And there's no government contracts, although probably a lot of government guys are in there. But anyway, you know, <clears throat> uh, so we don't know. It could be that, you know, like one minute in Gehenna is equal to uh, a thousand years here because of the intensity. So the time doesn't really make a difference. In other words, God can speed up the intensity and the soul doesn't die because it can only be annihilated. A human, a, a human being could die because his death really is a separation between the body and the soul, the neshama. In Gehenna is just neshamas, right? So they can't die, they just keep suffering, you know, and they are given the ability to withstand <coughs> the suffering, and therefore, you know, like one minute in Gehenna could be, you know, uh, a hundred, uh, you know, hundred years here, who knows? So there's no problem with time, you know. Truth is, we don't really know how long Gehenna lasts. Because Ailem Haba is separate from Gehenna, you know? It means 
what has to happen is before Oil Mahaba begins, all those people that will live in Oil Mahaba, the future world, they must be expiated. They have to have a kapora. You see? It means Oil Mahaba cannot begin until you have everybody who will get Oil Mahaba has to be cleaned, removed. All the, uh, the uh, judgments against them have to be satisfied. That's true. But at the same time, in some other area of the, uh, of the Bria, there can be Gehenna that goes on for, you know, however long it has to last. You see what I'm saying? <coughs> that, it's, it's the the, the Hame Adam Kalam guys. Yeah, yeah. Like, for instance... Uh, they, they, they could be suffering knowing there's a party going on next door. Well, it, it, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, they'll go on as long as they have to, and that's the end of it. You know, whatever Gehenna is. But the rule is that Oilam Habo cannot begin until every member of Oilam Habo has been clean, justice has been satisfied, right? And then it begins. But for those guys who will anyway not get Oilam Habo, that can go on for, you know, however long it takes till these guys clean up and then they're annihilated. So it's two different requirements here, you see? You put up a headstone after 12 months because Gehenim's over, right? Yes, but the, for, it's over for those people that will get Oilam Habo. But there are people that could be in Gehenim far more than a year. Yeah. Only, only people who are members of Oilam Habo will get it for 12 months, max 12. Well, we say 11 because he's not completely. Exactly. But, but for those who show him, it can go on for much longer than that, you know. What I said was that, but ultimately, even for them, it ends, because the final justice isn't Gehenim. For them, it's annihilation, Ibud, you see? So that can go on far longer, but uh, it's not going to be infinite, you know? So there are two different departments here. There's a department of Ilum Habo and the department of Ibud, those people that are headed for annihilation. But first, they have to go through Gehenim, and that can last. But those people who are going to Ilum Habo, you know, Everything's got to end for these guys, and then Oilam Habo can start for everybody. You see? So it's interesting, you know? One guy who's got to expiate, atone for his sins, he's going to hold up the whole Oilam Habo, because it doesn't open until that guy also is cleaned up. Can't you know? get into Oilam Habo if you got still sinning. No, you can't, exactly. You've got to be, you gotta be <coughs> clean. Caution. Well, yeah, clean. That's right. You have to have, uh, you know, excised all your judgments. Everything's got to be no, no klipa, no zoyama, nothing. You got to be a pure nishama. Then you can go to oil mahaba. Then everybody, hit. then oil mahaba opens up for business, as they say, you know. And what a business! It's something we cannot even comprehend. People are trying <clears throat> to get in. <laughs> Do you know why? <laughs> I, I can't resist. No, the I'm joke the is. Guy. I'm sorry. Wait, no, no. Do you know what the joke is? The joke is why do cemeteries have fences? Because people are dying to get in. That's that's where the joke goes. Anyway, so you know, you sort of like said it, you know. Anyway, the next topic, which is fascinating, remember one thing. God wants to make it easier to get into Ilam Habo. It's not that you, you know, God is not a tough boss. He wants people in Oilam Habo. So God has created certain institutions that make it easier to get into Oilam Habo. You see, Gehenim is one. Because what happens if the soul cannot live on this earth and go through a process of atonement? The suffering would be too great for a mortal to be able to survive. So therefore God created a spiritual purgatory where a neshama can suffer and be cleaned Right? So Gehenim is a tremendous chesed, kindness, that allows a person to remove the sins, right? Which he cannot do on this earth, because it would, by the laws of nature, it would kill him. But he can do it in the soul world, you see? So that's a tremendous act of chesed, even though it's strange to say that, but that's really what it is. It increases the odds or the probability or the amount of people that will ultimately get into Oil Mahabo. Because the future world is a place that you must have nothing of sin. You gotta be completely tore, clean, totally. Second 
incredible chesed, which I will talk about, we'll talk about, is if you didn't finish the job, now you come back and reincarnate. Next chance, you see? So by having reincarnation or incarnations, right, that increases the probability that what? That you, that there will be far more many people in the future world. You see? That's the second thing. And the third thing which we'll talk about is that there are other people that can suffer for you. You see? Number one, or that if you are associated with certain tzaddikim, their merit can actually bring you into their merit. So therefore that also, which is interesting, you know, that people can machaper, they can atone for your sins, so you don't do it, right? And they are willing or able to atone, right? And the second thing, you know, is your sins can be, in a certain sense, distributed to a certain amount of people. And not only that, but the merits. Where your, where your, their merits will go on you if you associate with them. You see? So all three ideas tremendously increase the probability that will be, most people will get into the future world. That could work in reverse too, that, that his merits goes to the, goes to the parents, right? Yeah, oh yeah. So it works well, both. Well that's, that's, like I said, that's the concept of association. Well that, what that is really is a concept of deeds. Because you are the cause of your kid. When, when a parent has a child, that child is a tzaddik. That parent is doing incredible. Because that, that parent caused the birth of the child. He's a cause of some, and, right? So therefore, as a result of that, he is gaining tremendous merit by the acts of this child. Of course, you know. And well, that's what I'm going to talk about next week, you know. These ideas and, and so on. Because it's a whole topic. Uh, you know, in terms. But what I'm trying to show you is that these things ultimately give a person a much greater chance of getting into Ilam Hapo. That's because God wants people in Ilam Hapo. You see. That's what He wants. Okay. Any questions? If, if a person has a very righteous uh, parent. Yes. And he's just a regular person. Let's say the, per the person. The pair was a Galahandar. Okay. And he wants, after they both pass away, will the son be allowed to be together <coughs> with the parent since the, the parent was on a much higher level? They're both, they're both righteous. The son was righteous too? Righteous, but not Galahandar. Not a very, he just he didn't. He didn't do the, the super... What, what, yeah, what you're really asking, is there, is there, is there, a, uh, is there a social experience in Oilam Habo? I mean, just because, you know, you, everybody has their own resonance, and that's really where they're seeping up all the stuff, you know? But does that mean you can't visit somebody in somebody's house, you know, and talk to them or whatever? Probably you can, you know? You're not, you're not alone in Oilam Habo. Well, even connected. Yeah, or even though you're receiving whatever reward... But you're not alone. There is a society. It's called the perfected community. Noilam Habo, and there will be interactions. Yeah, you know? Isn't it assumed that, that just like in this world, a, a person that's not on the same level sometimes can't have connection with someone else? So, I mean, let me take a step back. Is it assumed that parents. I don't know. I mean, take Moshe Rabbeinu, who's on his level. I'm sure any Jew that wanted to talk to him could walk, you know, in some way. You'd have to make an appointment with his secretary, maybe. But ultimately, yeah, Moshe, you know, you can get to see Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah. But, but could be that's only in this. There's a famous story that, that one of the big rabbis, he said, go to see that. Yeah, because in the doctor, next world. There was, a, there was a doctor that was a big tzaddik in Washington. Because over there, in the next world, you want to. Yeah, he said, go, go see him, even if you're not sick. Go see this doctor because he said in the next world you won't be able to see him. But he's big. He's an awesome son. You know, it does either. I, I don't think it means literally, figuratively. It means you know he will be so far ahead of you, probably socially, but in terms of uh, experiencing him as a soul, you probably won't because he's so far ahead. But does that mean you will not be able to encounter him or have an experience with him? You know, socially speaking, I don't think so. I think all Jews, by virtue of the fact that they're all connected in that sense, 
in some way, you know. I'm, remember, there's two concepts here. There's a concept of what's your experience as an individual in the future world. And then, are there interactions between the souls? You know, there is, the, uh, uh, it's reasonable to assume that there will be interactions. You know, Ilam Habo. He said at the funeral of Rabbi Krom, his son said that, that his, he lost his daughter. He said they, she, came, she came to him in a dream. Like the night before his father was lifted, and she, was, she looked very happy. But, and as her grandfather was coming to the next world. So that, I, mean, I don't know if you could make a proof from this, but it, it was indicative that they're going to have some type of, a, of a, like a reunion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There is a reunion. Yeah. Of, of relatives. Correct. That's what I'm saying. There is interaction. You feel that there is, even though yes. There, there are totally Doesn't different. make a difference. There is, there is. Because all Jews are connected with each other. You know, and, and by virtue of that, in a certain sense, Kol Yisrael are Raven Zelazer. Each Jew is a guarantor for another Jew. Hey, if you can be a guarantor, you're connected. You know what I'm saying? And by virtue of the connection, all Jews can interact with each other, you know, and so on. And then there's the individual, you know, what he's experiencing. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It was when you finally part with each other and say, okay, we'll see you around. He goes back to his palace and you go back to your uh, one room flat, so to speak, you know. I'm happy to get that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me tell you something. A one room flat in Ilam Habo is greater than all residences in this world combined. You know, even, even Erdogan's 1,000 room palace, which he built for himself, must have cost a billion dollars or something like that. That's, that is not even the equivalent of an outhouse in Oilm Habo. I want to talk to Moses. Have your people call my people who set up the lunch table. Yeah. 